Our next speaker is Shannon Wong from the New York State Coalition Against Domestic Violence and Policy Analyst for the YWCA's of the Northeast. Hello, I'm Shannon Wong and I'm honored to be representing the New York State Coalition Against Domestic Violence and the YWCA's of New York State. The YWCA is helping the New York State Coalition Against Domestic Violence with their legislative advocacy efforts for the end of this session. And I'd like to thank Senator Hassel Thompson and all the senators in attendance for hosting this forum and allowing us to engage in, conversa in conversations which will create paths to safety for victims of domestic violence. NISCADIV is a nonprofit membership organization representing the local domestic violence service providers across New York State. The YWCA has 21 local associations from New York City to Buffalo, many of whom are domestic violence service providers and all of whom serve women and children at the most vulnerable times of their lives. Victims of domestic violence have been assaulted by the people who claim to love them. Families are seeking shelter because their homes are unsafe. Girls are being told by abusive boyfriends that no one else will love them. Domestic violence victims are afraid of not being believed, afraid of losing their children, afraid of future violence, and afraid of being impoverished and left with nothing. It is the latter two fears that I'd like to discuss today. New York has a long history of working to increase victim safety. These efforts must continue, especially as it relates to firearms and domestic violence. We recognize that it is a difficult fight, but the victims we serve need you to stand up for them. They need you to help ensure that guns are not in the hands of abusers. When intimate partner violence is combined with access to a firearms, an already dangerous situation can become lethal. Access to firearms increases the risk of intimate partner violence and homicide by five times. In addition, abusers who possess guns tend to inflict the most severe harm on their victims. New York State data shows that firearms were used in 25% of domestic violence homicides. While statistics and headlines mostly speak to murders, they do not count for victims who are intimidated or threatened by guns, and they do not count for victims who survived the gunshot wound. The advocacy community is committed to joining your efforts to pass Senate Bill 1003, sponsored by Senator Peralta, which will require the court to inquire if a defendant or respondent possesses a firearm when they're issued an order of protection. Current law provides for the mandatory revocation or suspension of a firearm. However, the statute does not require the court to inquire as to the existence or location of firearms. This bill is needed to take the responsibility off the victim. Victims should not be expected to know each and every court option available to them. Many victims will not know that the court can prohibit an offender's access to firearms. It should be automatic for the system to create this protection for victims. I'm sure many of you are thinking an advocate could tell them, but it is very important to remember that a large number of victims seek help on their own and never access a domestic violence service provider. Currently, some judges do make such inquiries, while others do not. Since it is not required, it is the responsibility of the victim to bring the possession of the firearms to the attention of the court. Not only is this an unreasonable expectation for a victim, but the presentation of this information can place a victim at greater risk of retaliatory behavior, clearly as we have heard today. I'd like to switch gears for a minute and talk a little bit about another fear for victims of domestic violence, and that is the fear of being impoverished and left with nothing. We must also work on laws which recognize that economic self-sufficiency is essential for safety. We must focus on the economic empowerment of women also. We do not want to see another woman lose her job because they have taken steps towards safety. We have heard too many stories of women who are unable to attend a court proceeding or make appointments with an attorney or wait online at social services because they have been told if they take any more time off, they'll be fired, or more subtly and most often told, you need to make every effort to be here as much as possible. But most victims of DV are women. Most are the primary caretakers of children and the elderly. They have used a fair amount of time to take care of sick kids or bring elderly relatives to the doctor. Once you add up all those appointments, in addition to the appointments that they've needed for their own medical needs after an assault, a victim is clearly running out of time. Senate Bill 5526, which is sponsored by Senator Hassel Thompson, helps address this issue by prohibiting employers from discriminating against victims of domestic violence, allowing them to take time off charged to leave or unpaid. This bill asks employers to provide reasonable accommodations to victims limited solely to absence. 
It has some protections for the business community. The accommodations cannot cause undue hardship, and the victims should provide advance notice or documentation as to why advance notice was not possible. While at the same time, this bill insists that employers keep a victim's domestic violence experience confidential. We understand that there are many obstacles to legislative change, but we urge you to find ways to pass these bills which will increase victim safety and promote economic security. The victims we serve need you. They need your understanding, your skills, and your tenacity. Together, we can create paths to safety for victims of domestic violence. Thank you. Thank you. Are there, are there any questions? Yeah, just uh, one question. I know that um, in, in my experience uh, practicing law, usually when there is a uh, domestic violence case and there's issuance of law protection, they always, um, the court, um, one always asked uh, if the spouse of the individual um, has a firearm. The second one, if you're licensed to carry the firearm and you're arrested, it comes up in a database and you have to, at that point in time, um, drop off your firearm to the police department. The issue is it's inconsistent across the state. Okay. Some judges do ask and others don't. Um, and clearly, um, as an advocate, I don't want anyone to fall through those cracks. So um, in some ways, it's a very modest bill because many judges are already are already are are already inquiring. Thank, Thank you. you.